Roseanne, welcome to Time Team. Many, many, many programs. You Do you know how many Time Teams you did out of interest? Oh, it was just a wee bit over 100, I think. It was uh, 10 years of program wow. with, what, an average of about 13. So probably 130 plus specials. Unbelievable. That is a long-term service medal right there. We'll be sending you one. <laughs> and just to explain to all our friends out there, what is it you did on Time Team? Well, I suppose originally I was employed to do the um, 3D graphics, so visualizations. Um, so I came at it from a slightly different angle because I was actually architecturally trained. Um, and uh, yeah, I sort of fell in love with it pretty quickly, I think. What I loved was that you did that bit of magic, essentially, which was we'd do the archaeology, we'd be digging up stuff, we'd be working on site. But I kind of knew at some stage or other in post-production, we would be able to see what it looked like. What were the changes that you saw technically from those early days that, where stuff looked a bit plasticky to me to gradually getting nearer to a kind of more like a photorealistic expression of what it looked like? Uh, look, software developed. It changed in price. It became more accessible. And more people were trained in it. Um, it. So it was changing all the time. All these things have changed beyond all recognition since when we first started. Um, so the availability of it became much more easily uh, for easy for us to use. Um, and I, look, I think our knowledge grew, actually, as much as anything. As much as the software changed, we started to understand what it is that we were trying to show and how to show it. Um, and that software facilitated that. And I'm trying to remember now, but I'm trying to think what I would regard as Razan's greatest hits, the, the, pictures <laughs> that were, the pictures that would go on the album cover of your greatest hits. Do you remember one particular site or one particular building where you think, wow, we actually cracked it there. We did the whole three thing, 3D thing. We made the viewers see what it may have looked like in the past. Was there one that stuck out? I think one that will always stick out to me, and I'm not sure that it fulfills all of that, but it was Coventry Cathedral. And it was fairly on in my tenure, to be honest, but recreating the inside of the cathedral in the post-production time was such an epic proportion to do something like that. Yeah. Um, and it came out so well. Um, that to me is the standout one. But there's other ones, recreating a Spitfire from scratch, really rebuilding it. Ah, uh, there was loads of them. Loads of them were different. But um uh, yeah, the cathedral to me is always stands out. And we recently had the pleasure of watching you in action and Bridget, by the way, at Queensborough, um, which was the, the program that was memorable for some bizarre reason. We decided to construct a paper boat. And it was a castle, a round castle shaped like a flower. And you got involved with making paper and cardboard models of the thing. Oh, God, it all went wrong, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? It all went wrong? Well, I wouldn't describe it as all going wrong. I would describe it as a gradual process of realisation that the bits you'd made to begin with weren't what we ended up with. We went from something quite simple to a wonderful French chateau looking job. Yeah, and I, I seem to remember over three days trying to unglue things and then glue, glue them together again. Um, I think I was really glad to get back to the computer after that. It struck me that the big um, transition for me when I was looking at those things was what I would call textures. It seemed to me that if you had a wall of a cathedral, the body of a spitfire, we went from um, in the early days where it all looked a bit like stretchy plastic stuff. What was, what was the clue? What was the trick to getting the textures of those surfaces right? Oh, look, I think it's um, experience as much as anything. I think the more time you spend doing these things, the more of a catalog you built up, the more chance you got to speak to various experts who would turn around and discuss these things with you because I'm as much as a learning curve it was for me over that period 
what I found was that the the specialists, it was a learning curve for them as well because actually they hadn't worked with somebody like myself. So seeing something come to life allowed them to question aspects of it. So things like textures became suddenly real to them, things they hadn't actually had to think about. So as they gave me that information, we allowed to develop it. Um, so I think that was the changing points as well, yeah. And can you tell me about what I think of as atmospheric shadow and shade? Because often what happens with those things is you get this great sort of plasticky looking castle stuck in the middle of the landscape. I'm talking about other people's programs, obviously. Um, oh. <laughs> but uh, that idea that that landscape has got an atmosphere, has weather, has shadows, had all sorts of things. What, what did you layer that up and did that become more realistic for you when you could see that? If we had that opportunity, I would always like to add atmosphere to things. The difficulty is, as you know as well as anybody, that you have to cut your cloth regarding production. Quite often what our limitations were were time and how much effort we could put into something was limited by that time. Um, so given what you were trying to produce, you were, you were always running against how long it would actually take you to render. So when we produced something, we had to put it into the computer and then you let the computer run. And, you know, those computers compared to nowadays were quite archaic. So a render would take, sometimes it would take three, four days to produce this one animation. Every time you add another layer of sophistication to those, it added another level. And, of course, you didn't know until the end whether you'd perfected it because it's only when it's actually finished, you go, you look at it and go, it's not worked. The, the atmosphere is flickering or something. So you end up having to take that off because you've only got two days left, so you've got to make the animation simpler. So you ended up with these whole things, which was sometimes you'd love to have made it look like some sort of Hollywood spectacle, but you couldn't because you only had three days left to render it and the computer was taking too long per frame. Um, but, and how yeah. long did the how long did the Coventry Cathedral take approximately? Do you remember how much time you had to rebuild the cathedral? Um, I think I may have taken a little bit longer than I should have done on that one. I think it took about a month actually. Um, all said and all done, we probably were about two weeks over schedule on the post production of that, just because of how complex it was. I don't know whether I'm remembering this correctly, but I had this idea that if I could find a lump of stone from the original building and you could photograph, scan that lump of stone, then you could then use that texture to spread the surface, if you like, on the whole building. Is that the right way of thinking of it? Was it different from that? Uh, in principle, that's right. You can match it. Obviously, what happens is... Um, if you were to paint a piece of stone as a square and it was exactly the same as the texture you had of the stone, if you repeat it, it looks like brickwork yeah. because it has a pattern to it yeah. and that's not how nature works. So you end up having to try and get as big a texture as possible to alleviate those problems. Yeah. So the better the uh, source is to start with, the better the texture. We always ask this question to our time team guests at this point. Uh, fantasy time team, I can take, I can give you the whole time team and we can, you can take them anywhere you want and you at the end of it are going to do a reproduction of that building. You can have as much time as you want, as many hours as you want. Is there a, an historical place, historical building, historical scene that you would like to have had loads of time to reconstruct from anywhere in the world, anywhere in history? What would you choose? God, blimey, that's a hard one. Um, um, mm, I fell in love with some phases of Gothic when I was studying architecture. I loved that transition from sort of the squat Romanesque kind of features to this suddenly height, reaching up to what they were saying, was reaching up to God. Um, and 
when you look back at them, so uh, one that always makes me think is Durham Cathedral. When we get to that, and you see the various phases of the architecture within the structure, you can see where fashion changes and where the structure was changed. I love that kind of stuff. I love when you can see those different phases within buildings. So that kind of thing would be would be immense. So um, the one that I always remember from my studies was Amiens Cathedral. And I think it collapsed three times because they went too high each time. But I would love to look at all the historical stuff for that and see how far we could get into the reconstruction of that and visit that. That would be something I think would be stunning. Right. We'll definitely put Amiens Cathedral on our <laughs> list. Um, <laughs> now, quick question. Where are you now and what are you doing and what on earth does mishmish mean? Right, well, I'll ask this in reverse. Mishmish is um, a boyhood thing that I remember when I was living in the Middle East, and one of my cousins had a dog called Mishmish. And Mishmish means apricot in Arabic. Um, we, we are now, Bridget and I, um, with our two children, we live in New Zealand. We are at the foot of the Coromandel, Coromandel in a place called the Waihi Beach on the North Island. So we live uh, right next to the Pacific Ocean. And we have um, a heritage consultancy and looking at archaeology and architecture, um, anything to do with heritage. We work with museums, we work with developers, uh, we work with television. Bridge has had a series on TV here. Um, anything we can do to do with heritage, because we are a little bit besotted by heritage, um, over in New Zealand now. Um, and we're loving it. <laughs> And it, and it struck me, we were talk, talking earlier on about how fascinating you've got the, the remains of a Neolithic culture there that went on and on and on and didn't have a kind of lot of imposed layers on top of it. How, how would that work? Can you see that working as a sort of comparative cultural example if we were looking at the Neolithic in the UK? Is it right to call it Neolithic? And it's it's a it's a little dangerous here to call it Neolithic per se, yeah. um, but it was a a Stone Age culture, and as much that they use stone as their pre premium working tool. So you know there are comparisons because you're seeing the same sort of anthropological development of tools. There's a real crossover in that respect, and. Um, we aren't seeing the development of pottery or um, any other kind of artifacts. So what we see is really stone use and land development, um, cultivation. cultivation and um, uh, settlement. Yeah, yeah. Um, And those things, I suppose, are a comparative study to some of the early stuff you'd see in the UK. Um, so there must be crossovers in there because I think there must be similarities, the use of tools. Um, and, and I think there must be things that we can learn from the two and apply from one to the other. And I know you and Bridget are, um, have to do projects that involve, and I don't know if, if this is the right term in New Zealand, but the indigenous people of New Zealand, the, the mm -hmm. original people of New Zealand. How does that work as an archaeologist? Because you're across two cultures, I guess. It's a multicultural approach. And what's the feeling for archaeology uh, amongst the, the people uh, that you might call the indigenous people of New Zealand? Well, I think you, you could argue that they lost contact with part of their history when um, colonial rule came in and took over. And it's only re the reality of the um, treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi that was signed, which has allowed for um, them to reclaim aspects of their past. So whilst there is a crossover, certainly, there's a depth of wanting to know and understand the past. So you can certainly feel there's real interest in it and real wanting to understand, real connection with where they came from. And I think the benefit of being here and working in this kind of uh, sector is that we're dealing with people that are still connected to that past. 
when we talk about Romans in the UK and Anglo-Saxons, they're long gone. Whereas we're dealing with people who are looking back so many generations to people that actually were taking part in these activities on the land. So we really are bringing people back into, connecting them back into what their family past is, their whakapapa it's called here. Um, it's um, so it's an important role, I think. I think it's 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 becoming more and more prevalent. More uh, there's put more onus on it here, and I, I think it's a, it's a great thing to be doing. Historically, um, in British history and things like that, we'd refer to the Maori people uh, as part of the indigenous. What, what how are they talked about now? What, what, what's, what are they tribally referred to, or what's the New Zealand term for the indigenous people? Uh, Māori. Um, they, but you have, uh, I, I think, um, in some ways, to collectively just lump Māori together is is remiss. It's it's made up of a collective of different people. So you have iwis which are groups, and they have distinct nature and distinct stories about their past. And within those, you have smaller groups of hapu, and the hapu have their own stories and their own past and their own, you know, whakapapa, um, the histories, their own histories and stories that come with it. Um, so it's broken up into small parts. These people traditionally were tribal, so there's a lot of reaction against each other so there's still a lot of fighting actually between these groups even if it's not physical fighting there's a there's a political fighting yeah. um so there's a there's a there's a bit of a line you have to walk a tightrope sometimes yeah. um but we're not there to deal with the cultural or political side of it which is just to deal with the archaeological and historical side heritage side if we can and I'm going to race you forward in history a bit now to Roman period or uh, over here anyway, um, a Roman villa site. Uh, we've got a link to you in New Zealand. You're able to see what we're doing. Um, and how's it going to work? How are you going to do what you did for us in the past, but remotely in New Zealand? And what would we need to send to you so that you could do your reconstruction and you'd be doing it all from home so you could, you know, concentrate on it, spend as much time as you want. How would you manage that situation and what do we need to send you? Well, look, I think um, research is great. I probably don't have the access to quite the levels of research I probably would have once had in the UK. Um, we, we probably, because of the way technology has gone we were talking earlier before about technology um we can access stuff nowadays which means i can actually have a 3d of the site on my computer at home and be looking at it and that that makes life very easy um other than that i suppose it's you know as long as i can deal with the time difference there's not a lot not a lot to change to be honest i can still talk to people it just might mean i have to stay up till three in the morning um but uh no i think we can make that work <laughs> Um, what do you think, what is your, do you have a memory in your memory bank, as it were, of a villa site you did? Did, did we do a villa site with you? We did several, actually. Okay. Um, okay. I, and I, the trouble is, I cannot remind, remember the name of it, but we were working on one when we uncovered all the uh, mosaics. Yeah, yeah. Dinnington. Bridget, Bridget just told me Dinnington. Yeah, yeah. Dinnington and was one, Turk Dean was another, but yes, Dinnington was the big one in Somerset, yeah. Yeah, Turk Dean was before my time originally. I think we revisited Turk Dean, didn't we? We did Turk Dean 2 or something. Yeah. Um, but Dinnington was the one where it was sort of um, in Somerset. There was a there was a couple of walls and a, a bit ramshackled in um, in someone's field with some brambles growing over it. Yeah. And the next thing though, we know, we were uncovering that um, the mosaics. And... You know, it was, um, I think it was the first time I'd seen us uncover mosaics properly in in England. Yeah. Uh, loved it. Just that blew me away, to be honest. That's, uh, I get that feeling when you see something like that, that we're suddenly seeing a floor that wasn't walked on for um, 1,500 to 2,000 years. 
that blows me away every time. I'm sorry. <laughs> And the nice thing with the villas, uh, of course, is that we've got plans, we've got reconstructions, we've got Italian examples of villas. So we could feed into your sort of um, stock of research materials to bring together. Um, yeah. Is that we already know exist, but particularize them. How did things work with Neil? What was the division of labor when you were on site? Because we've got Neil working with us again. And so the, the simplest division was he did 2D and I did 3D. Right. Um, uh, he went out and did a lot of the, the photographing, yeah. the photography. We had the wonderful Victor, of course, who just brought things to life so beautifully. Yeah. Um, he was just a joy to work with in that respect. Um, but Neil was more about geography, more about getting the maps, getting bringing things together. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was the separation. <laughs> Sorry. And I like, you know, what I always thought, you know, sadly, um, Victor passed away recently. Um, yeah, so no. Talking with his family and things, we we've often have a sort of fantasy discussion whereby we would have Victor's pictures on a supercomputer. And we would take, what I always kind of wanted to do was combine your architectural view with Victor's human figures in scale yep. and sort of put them together. But Victor's style is quite a bit different. Do you think you can combine the two somehow now? Yeah, I think we should be able to. I think you should be able to, I mean, Obviously, we'll be dealing with 2D cutouts in that respect, but we can certainly try. I mean, obviously, the difficulty is we're dealing with a single perspective in that response, respect, but um, we can do it for certain things. We'll do certain views. Um, a little homage to Victor, which would be lovely. Um, I can't say how much I enjoyed working with him. He, uh, wonderful man. Absolutely wonderful. And I think if I was moving towards a future technology, it would effectively be almost a holographic reconstruction of your architectural building occupied by Victor's figures moving as though in real time proportionally inside your building so that your spaces are occupied by figures. Look, I, I think we're only a uh, hair's breadth away from that being possible, to be honest. In some respects, it possibly is possible Sorry, terrible English, possibly is possible. Um, we just have to look at gaming technology. And I think, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be able to do it soon. And once we do that, that means you could have Time Team Interactive out there and people could be playing and walking through villas at home. Be uh, be quite amazing, to be honest. Okay, well, look, many, many thanks to you and, and, and Bridget and the family for putting up with uh, interrupting your evening. Um, archaeology in New Zealand, is it a popular subject? People take an interest in it? And, and tell me a little bit about that, the world of archaeology in New Zealand. Look, if it, if it was down to me, I think we'd be giving... Um, a bit more credence to some of the first early colonial stuff as well, because we have this wonderful opportunity to record archaeology in living memory of people. And whilst it's, say, only 150, 200 maximum years old, we're talking to relatives who still have relics of these things and photographs. We could set a great benchmark on that side of things for the future. But... On the whole, if you talk to people in New Zealand, their first reaction is history, archaeology. We haven't got any because they sort of lump Māori stuff together and they turn around and say anything colonial is not history, yeah. um, which I think is short-sighted personally. But, um, but it's there. It's growing interest. And it would be amazing to do a sort of New Zealand equivalent of a sort of colonial DMV you know, mm -hmm. a site. And do those sort of places exist? Are there places that used to be a name on the map and are now just fields? There's a lot of stuff which is undiscovered. The depth of um, occupation, especially where we're living in the Bay of Plenty, it's, it's amazing the amount of stuff that still isn't being known or discovered. 
Well, I certainly look forward. I, I have a, I mean, I just think it's a wonderful idea somehow that uh, you and Bridget and Mishmish are a kind of time team offshoot somehow in New Zealand, where you know, you're our exploratory team partners to look at yep. the amazing archaeology and landscape of New Zealand, which I think would be thrilling. Um, Fantastic. So thank you Hello. very much for taking the time. Very nice to talk to you and Bridget and the family again. And uh, I look forward to being in touch. And uh, uh, the thought of you reconstructing architectural buildings and our three-dimensional Victor figures occupying them, I'll leave that with a, you can sort the software and we'll talk about that next time maybe. Okay, love to see you, Tim. All the best. can't do any of this work without you so please subscribe back us on patreon and make sure that time team comes back again <laughs>